We're discussing digital identity with Eric Haller, Executive Vice President of Experian and Global Head of Experian Data Labs. Sometimes it's easier to think about analog and how that might relate to digital. Uh, you know, in our, our analog our analog life, our identity is, is pretty straightforward. We're all used to uh, showing a driver's license or an identity card or a passport. It's been uh, authenticated uh, by, by somebody that we trust, like the, like the government. Um, it's something that uh, uh, we use as an uh, entry point to get uh, open up our first checking account at the bank or uh, when we go to the doctor's office and we provide insurance and, and, and our identity. Um, in the digital world, it's very similar. Um, if you think about that, that provenance or that, that trusted the source of identity, um, it, it often starts with some things that we don't even see. Um, maybe if you go back 30 years, it started with uh, certificate authorities or credential authorities in our, in our public and private uh, 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 keys that were used to encrypt our data still today. Um, but banks will use things like uh, uh, multi-factor authentication, send a pin to your, uh, your phone to ensure that the communication that's going back and forth is with the person that they think it is. But that digital footprint is growing and expanding into a lot of pieces of information that most of us aren't familiar with or think about. And that, that data becomes kind of the, the gateway uh, to how we access goods and services in a digital environment. So why is this such a complex topic? Complexity can you know, be viewed a couple different ways. One is if you don't know much about it, it becomes complicated, right? So Sometimes just education and awareness cleans up complexity. But the other thing is that it's, it's, it's rooted in technology, and I think that's, that's a part of it. So when you start thinking about you know, how does your device represent itself in a digital environment and how that device attaches to you as an individual or you as a household, it gets into data and elements and, and networks and things that most people don't really put a lot of time and thought into. But those become the, the the Legos or the building blocks to who we are and who we represent, who rep what represents us in our identity in a digital world. So this this notion of having an unambiguous identity involves not just you one one personally, but your various devices and even potentially your locations. Yeah. So you think about it, like we go back to analog, we said, well, the U.S. government stamped their approval that I'm Eric Haller. I went in, I provided a birth certificate or something. I provided all this information and the government said, yep, they took my picture. And then they said, hey, you know, if I ever have to match against a database, I'll look at this idea, maybe a picture of somebody's face and say, that's Eric Haller. In a digital world, there aren't a lot of authorities. There are some, there are some. Experian plays a role in that. But there's a lot of data elements that represent us. So the game is trying to attach those, those data elements that represent us digitally to some kind of authority. So, so for example, you mentioned location. Um, if I'm conducting commerce from my home on my iPad or my, my mobile device, uh, it's very likely that, particularly if I'm using a mobile app, that GPS lat long coordinates are attached to that device. Over time, uh, you would be able to see a consistent pattern of lat long coordinates associated with that commerce activity and if one were so motivated, they could take that lat long coordinates, go to a map and go, hey, this is, this is a home address and this home address matches with Eric Haller. So over time, those lat long coordinates become an element that represents us digitally, can be consistent and can be leveraged. The only thing is, what happens when I conduct commerce from another location? Then those lat long coordinates aren't as valuable, but maybe there's some other things that are as valuable because I'm still using the same phone and that may have a consistent, consistent data elements around the phone, whether it's the operating system and the screen size and the device type, or maybe something more complicated like a, an advertising ID or something in there that so some specific things that might represent uh, uh, features of the phone that are unique. So I guess that raises the question, how do you establish digital identity? And it sounds like there are lots of individual pieces that you assemble together in order to create the picture. Is that a correct way to say it? I think that's, that's right. Um, you know, for, for one is most people have a digital identity, whether they care to establish it or not. Um, because if you're, if you are 
interfacing through a device over the web. Um, there are there are data elements that need to be able to drive information back and forth or properly lands on your device. Um, and then if you actually buy something online, you're going to start uh, opening up things that will relate back to where you're having goods shipped to and your name, address, your credit card number, all these things that are, are captured online. There are people that don't have access to the internet and aren't, aren't, aren't in, in engaging in commerce online. And those, those folks are like less likely to have any kind of digital footprint at this stage. Sometimes I'm, I'm personally concerned that there may be people groups that will get left out of this. And that's why it's so important that everybody has, has access to the internet and has access to conducting commerce in this way, because over time, that digital identity, as it, as it fortifies, it becomes more consistent, uh, becomes more credible, uh, will become more of a, a gateway or key to convenience and convenient access to goods and services. Um, and as we saw in this pandemic, that can even ostensibly uh, um, uh, go to healthcare and having access, uh, convenient access to healthcare online, uh, being diagnosed. So that, that identity does become important. Um, uh, and it's something that we all, we, we all have a vested interest in, in, in making sure that it's done right. So the nature of digital identity has, or the importance of digital identity goes far beyond shopping alone, but there are very broad societal implications. Definitely. I think there's been, there's so many, uh, so many entities that are, are, are giving this a lot, not, not just, uh, uh, private businesses, private enterprise, like Experian, where you know, we, we, are, we, we focus on this quite a bit, actually, and, and trying to make sure that our clients are doing their best at, at verifying, authenticating identities and making sure that they're not bots that are impersonating people or imposters that have come in and trying to, trying to get, gain uh, access to, to a consumer or a business's uh, uh, financials, uh, but also the government, the U.S. government. And there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, committees and, and uh, we'll say, initiatives that are underway to try to give better definition to this. I, I think if you study it a little bit, you would see that, you know, one of the questions that I get asked about the credibility of the long-term viability of digital identity is, is the inclusion of blockchain. There's a, uh, because blockchain, blockchain actually comes uh, uh, with some promises around portability, which is, is key. You know, if we're talking about leveraging a digital identity in multiple environments and multiple use cases, that portability becomes a factor. And the immutability or the uh, the uh, protection that that comes with blockchain that somebody can't tamper with it that it that it becomes uh, we'll call it tamper proof over time. Those are key things. Whether the where the block where the whether the blockchain uh, is is the solution or not um, really doesn't matter so much as those those uh, challenges of immutability portability are met. Um, and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother conversation. We have time. We can, we can talk a little bit about that because there's some real challenges uh, in that, in that paradigm. What strikes me and also surprises me a little bit is you're a technologist, but it sounds like you are almost equally concerned with the technology dimensions on the one hand and the, the implications for individuals on the other hand, at the same time, I think the, the the two go hand in hand. Often, often the technology uh, becomes the easier uh, of the two equations. So, like I was talking about blockchain, I, I, I get asked a lot, oh, why why isn't that happening like super fast? You know, why why is if that's a, a really good way to go, why why aren't we going that direction? And and it's not the technology. It's 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 the business the business proposition. You need a value proposition on both sides of the equation. Consumers have to be incented enough to carry a digital identity that can meet those requirements. Uh, put the time in to be authenticated, have it loaded in some kind of digital wallet or environment where they can easily use it. And ex parties that would accept that identity in exchange for conducting commerce in some way or providing a service in some way have to to accept the fact that there are going to be a lot of people that are going to use this and have to build in advance of that. So it's a bit of chicken and egg. We see that a lot in things like payment systems. There are a lot of chicken and egg uh, business models out there. Uh, and, and so when you get into, uh, gosh, I want to do digital identity perfect and I want the perfect environment for it. Well, you, 
technically you can set that up, but business wise, you, you have to overcome that chicken and egg paradigm and uh, making sure that both parties are equally incented to, to jump in. We have a question from Twitter that I think is related to this. And Wayne Anderson, who's a regular watcher and is the most prolific tweeter I think I've ever met, and his tweets are brilliant. They're great. And he asks, uh, interactive two-factor authentication at scale has been a challenge for consumers to balance convenience. When do we get to better protections and what are we missing as an industry? And I think this gets to the incentives point that you just raised. So a couple of things about two-factor. Uh, uh, one is, believe it or not, so you know, we, do, uh, we did a survey for consumers around the globe uh, in 10 different countries, and we asked them uh, what was the number one thing that they are concerned with when conducting uh, business online, accessing goods and services digitally. And the number one thing they said was 55% uh, of them said security, number one. Then we asked them, uh, well, what are the things that you would... Uh, uh, value in terms of protecting you. Uh, number one was uh, what we would find on our phone, um, facial recognition, uh, fingerprint, fingerprint access. Number two was this two, two factor authentication, sending, principally sending a pin to the, to the phone, which surprised me because like, like your, your, your listener said, you know, it's, it's very inconvenient, but, but people right now have been at least at least market research would tell us people right now actually are are almost trained to trust that that process works that they see the pin it goes on their phone then then whoever they're interacting with probably most likely banks that seems to be who who uh, does that most but uh, that that there's a sense of trust how do we get past that um, oh and by the way the third thing was uh, uh, actually I think one of the ways we do get past it which is consumers said they don't want to provide data but they were hoping that there's a lot of information that's already in the system that could to do this in, on their behalf. Um, I, we refer that to as uh, uh, behavioral analytics or uh, behavioral biometrics, but data that that uh, uh, the data that you don't that don't see the ambient we'll call it ambient ambient data uh, that that you can leverage, um, and that that could be. It could be the promise. I'm not saying it is, but it could be. And I'll give you some examples of what that might mean. Um, so, so if you think about how quickly it takes uh, to respond to an item in a shopping cart, you know, if, you, if you're shopping online, you might have four pages to go through before you actually conclude your, your shopping cart experience. It might ask you, you know, who, who's going who's gonna to ship you goods? Uh, what's your credit card uh, number that you want to use? Um, maybe I'm going to give you one last offer before you, before you hit the, I'm, I'm buying it thing. So it might be three or four things. A bot, a bot will, will go through that really fast, faster than a person. Some, some, you know, out in the world now, I think fraudsters are getting smart. They're slowing their bots down because, you know, you, you can, you can figure out it's a bot. Um, but the, an individual, um, over time, uh, will have consistent patterns and how quickly they they hit those buttons. Um, so profiling those kinds of things, uh, uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, I'm on my phone and I'm, 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 touching, I'm touching things on my phone in, a, in a, a commerce situation. How I touch my phone uh, will, will provide some insights into whether I'm a bot or not. A bot might only fire up a tiny number of pixels on my phone uh, whereas, you know, my finger is going to fi fire up over a hundred when I, when I touch it, I can't, I can't help myself, right? Your, your finger, even if you barely touch it, you're going to fire up more pixels than it'll than likely happen. So I can screen out a bot. An imposter may use like a, a person, uh, not a bot, but a person who's not me may, may, uh, choose to, to swipe up or swipe down or swipe left or swipe right or, or, or click on different things. And if I, if I'm going through a security thing, I have to pick fire hydrants out on a, on a bunch of pictures. I may have a different way of doing that. I may start from the bottom, lower left-hand corner and work myself upper right versus a poster wouldn't know that and, and pick a different way. These are, and they all sound a little like, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. But in aggregate, as you start building these things up, they, pick, they paint a picture. And, and so is that picture accurate enough where you can avoid things like annoying pins sent to my phone? Uh, we're not there yet. 
But the question will be is over time, as we develop these things, um, that we should be able to get there. That's everybody, when you, when, when you know that less than 1% of the time it's a bot or it's an imposter and 99% of the time it's a real human being, uh, that a legitimate, per, the legitimate person that represents themselves to be this person, you want to make that process as convenient as possible. Everybody's incentive to do that. So it's a matter of trying to figure out uh, the right combinations in the background that gets us to a confidence point where the false positives are low and our detection rates high. So that's, that, that's how I would answer that. We have a question from Twitter from another excellent uh, regular listener who asks excellent questions. And Arsalan Khan says that on the surface, it seems that digital identity for consumers is similar to single sign-on at enterprises. Are there any lessons learned or overlaps that can help us understand this and, and help us do a better job in the enterprise? I would say a few things. One is, one of the things we learned from the survey that we did, and, and, and this I'll say goes against the notion of single sign-on, but I, don't, I know that your, your, I believe your Twitter follower isn't, isn't advocating passwords. I, I don't think that's what they're saying. But I, will, I do want to say this one thing about passwords is that people don't like them anymore. I don't know if they ever did, but they really don't like them now. They don't trust them. You know, Experian, actually, you know, one of the services we have is uh, operates on the dark web. And so when you see these massive data breaches that occur, you know, there's the, the, the CD underbelly of, of the internet uh, where this is traded, all that data is traded and sold. Uh, and we, we do a, a very good job of uh, staying close to that, those trading environments so that we can know what's being compromised and sold so we can leverage that information, one, for our own products and services, and two, so that we can alert consumers that subscribe to us that, hey, your password's just been compromised on this, these, you know, these accounts. People don't trust the password process. Some, a lot of them don't remember all their passwords. Trying to remember them is becoming a challenge. So single sign-on, I get it. Um, I mean, I use, I use my, uh, uh, my devices which plugs in passwords on my behalf. Very cool. Um, but you're still, you're still trapped in the password paradigm. And I, and I think that's, that's one of those things that I like the idea of enterprise-wide digital, digital identity, getting myself, getting myself um, uh, out of the password paradigm. Uh, but what that might look like, you know, I, I kind of go back to this, you know, that analog thing, which goes back to provenance and trust who's going to be the architect of that and, and how is that going to be rolled out? Um, and I think we'll have to look to private enterprise uh, for the most part to do that. Um, and companies like, like Experian, I mean, Experian definitely is, is a player in that space, but there are a few uh, uh, companies in there that are all uh, focused on that, on that big prize. And Katie Waldenberg raises the question of deep fakes, which is a really interesting question. And, how can you tell? They're so good these days. You know, when we talk about digital identity, one of the things that uh, we don't talk so much about is our, our pictures, our voices, our videos. Um, you know, you, you and I right now are, are uh, creating uh, uh, our, our digital presence in this, in this talk show. And, um, and we've seen that um, the area of deep fakes are getting more and more uh, challenging to determine whether it's a fake or not. In fact, um, USC did a study three years ago on deep fakes and the ability to t detect them and said uh, 95% of all deep fakes you can detect, which was pretty good until Google just did a contest that ended a few months ago. And they, they seeded a database with 3,000 deep fakes and the best researchers in the world could only detect, detect 65% of the deep fakes, which means the world of deep learning, and in this case, uh, usually uh, generative adversarial networks, the ability to um, fine tune your fake signal, whether it's you know the lighting, the camera angles, the continuity or congruity of the background, the demarcation of the lines, blinking, mouth movement, all these things that comprise uh, what, a, what a neural net has to assess and, and replicate to turn my face into Tom Cruise or something. Uh, on a TikTok video is getting better and better and it's becoming more challenging to detect that. So um, in the point of the ability to detect deep fakes, I would say there's, there's a couple different angles. 
Um, one is, one is uh, well, today, right now, deep fakes are really only single direction, which is kind of more the fake news type thing. They're not interactive. You don't have the opportunity to ask questions to determine whether or not uh, that digital representation of an individual is, is authentic or not. Um, you, you're just listening. You're in listening mode. You're reacting mode. So it's uh, uh, one is track it, trace it, just like you would any other video to determine whether or not the source of the video uh, is um, uh, or audio is um, uh, could be a, a nefarious source. Um, so, for example, uh, looking at like, hey, this video just came from Nigeria. You know, I'm not not disparaging Nigeria, but but there's been a lot of fraud rings. I'll say from 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 that country that if you can trace it back, you might get some insights on whether or not uh, it's fraudulent or not. The other thing is trying to go the hard route, which is which is looking for those digital signatures that on all those things that I talked about, all those aspects of the video I'm talking about that would uh, lead one to believe to score it enough to say that that it's a, a fraudulent deep fake. I'm more. I'm more concerned about the evolution of that, by the way. So I, I, made, I made the point that it's one directional. The, 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 this, the more concerning aspect of deepfakes will be the future. And the future is what I would characterize as the convergence of these identity aspects that we have. So our, our voice and what we say combined with video. Um, so it's, it's more the, I'll say, the convergence of natural language processing. Uh, which we're seeing huge advances, you know, with GPT-3 and OpenAI and what they're doing there is, is tremendously, it's exciting, but a little makes me a little nervous. Uh, deep learning, you know, you could look at, uh, I go back to the Facebook days when they were trying to train uh, two, server, two, two, two uh, computers to negotiate with each other using deep learning. Uh, negotiation and, and, and deep learning bothers me a bit. And then you have this aspect of, of replication of, 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 uh, our facial features and, and those things, which we're seeing in the one way deep fake, but you combine all three of these things together, this convergence of NLP, deep learning, deep fake, all of a sudden you have something that could be formidable uh, and, 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 and challenging. Um, so actually in our labs today, that's what we're focused on. Like how, what are the, what are the signatures that we'll be able to pick up even in, we'll call it, high order natural language processing like, like G, GPT-3, what are the things that we can do such that if we do or when we get to these stages, we can have the, the defenses set up for consumers and businesses to be able to weed those deep fakes out. How many years do you, do you anticipate this? this that, is, that is the debate. I, that is the debate. I, and, and, and sometimes I, I very rarely get this right. You know, it's like one of those things where Sometimes I think it'll take 10 years to get there and it takes two years. Sometimes I think it'll take two years to get there. It takes 10 years. I, um, I, I will say this, like in the world of deep fakes, I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of cool things about deep fakes, by the way, uh, education, entertainment, particularly entertainment. I mean, I imagine a whole world of entertainment that will, will come from, from, from this type of technology. Um, but I was having a conversation with my daughter, I want to say a few weeks ago, and I was saying, can you imagine being your favorite uh, comic book hero? And, and, and being the star, being the star in like, uh, you know, Infinity Wars or whatever, and again, and watch a cool movie like that and, and being one of the superheroes. And, and you, you just, uh, it's part of the process. And, and, uh, and now all of a sudden I'm a character. Uh, and she's like, dad, that's going to be at least five years away, maybe 10 years away. And, uh, and then I went online and there's a mobile app you can download where you can be your favorite superhero fighting uh, Thanos uh, and, and there's a clip and you get to pour it in and, and be that person. It, it is going to happen likely faster than, than you'd think. Um, if I, again, my daughter built a Twitter bot that had me, I, I talked to that Twitter bot for about 45 minutes and she was using GPT-2, not GPT-3, but very engaging and insightful. And, you know, so I, uh, I, I'm shocked at how advanced NLP is, is, has gotten already. And so when you think about three to five years from now, that convergence seems very likely to me. Where does the convergence of, say, GPT-3 happen with 
identity. And let me just say, for people who don't know, I actually advise a startup that has a front end to GPT-3. And it, it's amazing what it can produce. So for people that don't know, GPT-3 is this AI model of the internet. It's scooped up a good portion of the internet and you type in a topic and it will then generate text websites, code, all kinds of different things, but you can use it for text. And some of the text it creates is indistinguishable, almost indistinguishable from what a person could write. When I think about identity in the future, one of the things that always pops into my mind is it's almost like a stereotypical or cliche science fiction uh, uh, TV TV or movie or whatever, where, where some astronaut goes into outer space and he, and he comes back like 20 years later. And, and, and he looks the same, sounds the same, acts the same, and everybody's excited that this astronauts come back and they're a part of things, except their spouse. And their spouse is like, you know, it's not the same person. It's an alien. You know, I, I know it's an alien, right? but how do they know that? How, do they, how does the spouse know? Because it's certain behaviors that they pick up. And with like GPT-3, when you think about how will it train, how will it train? Well, and you use the, the point, it trains on, on the internet. Okay, so what happens over time when I, when I want to fine tune it and train it on what people write in comments on, on Facebook or write in emails or write in texts? And, and so it will start to pick up personas. And over time, you should be able to do that. Now, now reality is in this day and age, um, all of these things take a tremendous amount of training to replicate any kind of individual identity, let alone pass the scrutiny of somebody who actually knows the person, right? Like we watch the TikTok videos of Tom Cruise. If you knew Tom Cruise, you'd be like, that's not Tom Cruise. It looks like Tom Cruise, kind of sounds like Tom Cruise a little bit, but it's not. Um, and, and so to get that level of scrutiny, I think that's where GPT-3 or we'll call it GPT-4, whatever comes out next, or five, um, that's where, you know, it'll be, it'll be people that know an individual will be able to know from the questions it asks and the answers it receives, that's not the right person. So one, one, one person, individual uh, scientist on our team told me, if you ever, if you ever think you're talking to a, uh, an NLP bot, um, one of the things that bots can't do right now are answer uh, logical problems. So you, you could say, you know, what's three times four minus two? And, and a bot's not going to be able to tell you that. So, so that's, that's, that's one of those things where, you know, I'll say that's a, that's a trick um, if, you, <laughs> if you ever wonder. Uh, but, but we're looking for that kind, of, that kind of thing that says, you know, are there things digitally we can do or uh, um, arms consumers with an education that when it comes to that point, when they are in that situation, what can they do to, to protect or defend themselves, uh, filter and ensure that they are talking to the, the, real, the real authentic individual? We have another question from Twitter, again from Arsalan Khan. Arsalan just asked great questions. He says, if a single company creates digital identity that has all of your information, wouldn't the hacks become more targeted and wouldn't it create a monopoly at the same time? I would say digital identity at this stage would be more like the Pandora's box. It's already been opened. It's already everywhere. Um, I would say that, that it's an interesting proposal. I, you kind of have to agree, right? One company had it all. Yeah, yeah. But, but I don't think that's even possible. Like, I, I don't think you could, maybe, maybe if somebody was so innovative that they came up with the notion of digital identity in a way, um, kind of like the, I'll say the, the mystical person that's created uh, Bitcoin. Right, the uh, you know come up with something in a way that that uh, totally revolutionizes it. Um, uh, then maybe you're right there, but I I don't think that's really I don't know. My mind's not broad enough, I think, to think how that that would play out and, and happen. Can we go back to blockchain, which you mentioned earlier, and just describe to us that intersection of blockchain and digital identity and does this have anything to do with bitcoin and besides what what coin should we buy <laughs> i 
I don't want to get into crypto and, and, and mostly because I'm not a crypto expert. Uh, I wish I was. I wish I, I, uh, I was a crypto expert. It's funny because a lot of my graduate school colleagues invested quite a bit in crypto and have done, done well. So good, good for them. I, uh, uh, I did not. Um, but uh, blockchain, if, if you're familiar with crypto, you know that blockchain's uh, 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 a core part of the crypto technology uh, that has been stripped away and, lo- and, and used uh, as, a, we'll call it a, a form of a database um, that uh, uh, is being used in different use cases. And in the digital use case, um, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, the World Bank, I think uh, uh, the World Economic Forum, um, and then you look at like some of the large uh, multinational consulting companies, some of the major tech companies like Microsoft um, have, have invested in the notion of a ubiquitous blockchain for digital identity. And, and, and again, I think, you know, it's very interesting, like, uh, you know, at, at Experian, we have, I don't know, over a hundred million consumers using our, our, uh, our mobile app. So if you think about, you know, I'm, I'm, one, uh, I'm one of these consumers, maybe I carry my digital identity in this mobile app and it makes my life easier in some way. When I conduct commerce, it's easier. When I conduct, uh, I, I make my doctor's appointment, it's easier. Things that, that really are identity dependent uh, because there's some kind of permission that's required or access to something that has some kind of financial value to it. So if you participate in this blockchain and, and you're carrying that around in your app, um, then the game is, uh, for any of these players that I mentioned, is making sure that there are a number of places that it can be used, whether it's with banks or retailers or healthcare providers or you know, wh- whomever. Maybe it's my, my Disney ticket or something. I, I don't know. But the, um, that's where I think it's a challenge because, again, I, you know, I mentioned earlier in the show about the chicken and egg. If you're, if you're going to invest in blockchain to receive that digital identity, the first question you're going to ask is, how many guys have this? today. But I'm going to open up how many po- people are going to use it. And if you say, well, nobody's got it yet. Well, well come back to me when there's you know, a good number of people that come in, come in the door and they're going to use it. When you go to the consumer and you say, do you want to invest the time to do it? The answer is, yeah, where can I use it? Oh gosh, I just put all this time in to get authenticated and verified by a trusted authority. And, and now I'm going to be able to use this, this, this credential that I've got. Um, uh, my digital, my new digital ID, it's going to make my life super easy. Where can I go use it? And if the answer is, well, really, you know, nowhere yet, but we're going to get there, then they don't want it. So you got to, you got to seed or, or wait one of these things, one or the other, like uh, uh, Apple Pay did a fantastic job. I thought, you know, that was one of those uh, de novo payment, payment systems where um, I couldn't wait to get Apple Pay on my phone. I don't know if you would say, I'm an iPhone user. So I'm, 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 I'm a payment guy by, by nature. I worked at Visa and MasterCard. So I'm like really in the payments. I couldn't wait to use it. And I thought Apple did a fantastic job of signing up a whole bunch of merchants right out of the gate so that I could um, use, my, use my Apple Pay. As soon as, I, as soon as it was good, I could go to Subway Sandwiches and buy a sandwich. So anyway, that's, I think that is the real challenge of blockchain. It's not the technology itself as much as figuring out a way the, to get to get the prime the pump and get it going, such that um, uh, uh, we could have that kind of infrastructure in place. We have a question from Twitter relating specifically to blockchain. Elizabeth Shaw is wondering about the um, the energy, the energy processing, and the intensiveness of energy use, and does that factor in at all into thinking about blockchain with um, digital identity? That must be a true, uh, uh, I'll call it information technology professional that asks questions like that. I uh, have a good friend that uh, 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 just recently retired as a global CIO. And that was the number one thing that he, he'd always bring up is the, uh, uh, we'll call it the, the challenge, the computational challenge in blockchain. I, I don't know. I, I don't really know if I can you know, with an expert opinion, answer that other, other than to say, you know, I think it would depend on the, um, uh, uh, how often or frequent that identity is being authenticated and validated in the environment. So if you think about, 
if I open up a new account for something, my identity is authenticated principally one time during that process. Um, when I am online in a shopping experience, uh, many today will be validating my behaviors uh, continually. And so and what I mean by that is as I'm traversing a website, how do I go from the moment I get to the website to the shopping cart? Is it like a beeline? Is it an unusual thing? Am I looking at source code of the website before I, I get? So, so my, my process to go from beginning to end um, is continually being evaluated. So if, if, you're, if you're asking, would the blockchain be required, whatever this, 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 this notion of a digital identity blockchain, and would it, would it be required to be accessed um, frequently like that? Then I think you got a real, real, you have a real challenge. But if it's the kind of the one time thing, you know, uh, maybe not so much. But like I said, I'm not an IT professional per se. Um, I have heard that come up as as a challenge to blockchain. Um, and it's a good question to ask. Eric, uh, to change gears a little bit earlier, you spoke about the societal implications of digital identity and access to the kinds of identity that will help a person function in society, whether it's shopping online or shopping even in person. Mm. Can you talk more about those issues? I think that's extremely important. I will say this is one of the reasons why I like being an experience is uh, uh, financial inclusion is actually a, a very big part of, you know, the World Economic Forum would say it's one of the top seven things that they focus on around the world, financial inclusion. And, and when we talk about digital identity and that digital footprint, if I, and, and it's a challenge in the US, but it's really a challenge globally. And this is a real global challenge is, this, this notion of being outside of the process. And, you know, when we talked about uh, what comprises your digital identity today, and we talked about all these different data elements, the more you are online, the more, um, or the stronger the footprint that you have to bring to bear uh, when you're in that environment, any kind of transactional environment. And so it's likely that put fraud aside, um, your experience will be convenient because you're really easy to see. Actually, you know, the, uh, the idea of fraud typically only comes into play when something's different, when everything's the same and it's the same consistently. Well, you, you can, you can, you can permission a lot. So, so if you're, if you're not in the game or you're barely in the game of being online uh, or conducting or transacting with your mobile device, um, then you will be disadvantaged over time. It's just very logical to ostensibly say that when you do engage, you're going to have to go through whatever processes will be in place at that, at that time. So it is important to get, get people access uh, to the internet. I know there's so many initiatives outside of the company that I'm in uh, to try to try to make that happen, uh, but it's important. I think, you know, there are other areas of digital identity um, as Katie had brought up. I think it was Katie about deep fakes. Um, the, this is an area that's new in many ways. I mean, we're just, I mean, granted the Tom Cruise video that the, the um, Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi and the, and the slurring of the words, uh, Barack Obama. I mean, we've seen a lot of deep fakes that have caught, caught a lot of press. But having said that, this is still the beginning stages of this. This is still just the technology is just start, you're just starting to see the I'd say the first fruits of deep learning uh, in, in, in these in these ways or NLPs we're talking about it's all brand new I mean a lot of these things that we're talking about have only been in the last four or five years you know deep learning uh, probably I, I don't know I'm sure the scientists will correct me back home but but you know I'll say deep, deep learning is still relatively new you know between Hinton and, and Andrew Ng and, and some of these top professors that, that brought this brought this to us maybe last 10 years. When we talk about uh, uh, open AI, that's what's, what are they like, three years old, four years old? So all this stuff is pre pretty new stuff. Um, uh, so I, I'm bringing all this into in, in play because when you think about consumers and consumer protection, making sure that we create an environment where we know what's illegal and not illegal, what's safe and not safe, making sure that there are the right organizations in place to pursue and fraud takes place. Um, these are, these are things that are, are going to grow 
And, and so, yeah, as a society, I think we have to be mindful of that. We have to put the right energy and resources against it. Eric, as we finish up, what are the kinds of challenges around this that keep you awake at night? There's been so many data breaches over time that, that um, making sure that we are constantly thinking of, I'll call it the next generation of how we identify and authenticate individuals is critical um, to, to a lot of what we, what we do, you know, with the financial access to, uh, and access to services, et cetera. Um, that's what keeps me engaged at Experian is that, um, you know, we have the, the resources and the kinds of indiv individuals that want to invest the time to try to push the envelope on what's going to come next. And I think you have to, given what we've experienced uh, to date, you know, in terms of data breaches and those, those types of things. What advice do you have to businesses, to policymakers around, even to consumers around uh, digital identity? It's, it's an issue that affects every single one of us. I get a lot of value out of tracking, um, I, I actually, because I'm an employee at Experian, so I, I told you before the show, I said, I really talk, don't talk about our products, but here I'm talking about our products. The, um, but this one in particular, um, if you want your identity kind of managed and tracked, uh, knowing if you know, your, your data has been compromised, uh, your passwords have been compromised, I find that to be tremendously valuable to me. I mean, I can't tell you how often I've gotten an alert that says, this account and this password has been compromised and we know it because we saw it out on the dark web. And, and I instantly go, okay, I'm going to not only change that, but anywhere else I use that particular password because I'm a guy that uses similar passwords across multiple properties. I will go and I'll, and I'll change that. So I, I think being aware, I think being aware and responsible is, is something that we all, we all need to take to heart in this day and age, particularly as we shift more and more of our behavior online. And how about to policymakers? What advice do you have for policymakers on dealing with this issue? Being able to, to properly define what is um, uh, okay and not okay. Uh, you know, where, does it, where is the line from entertainment and education to, um, uh, well, we'll call it, uh, I, Getting, taking somebody's identity in an unwarranted or un, you know, unlawful fashion, and then what are the penalties for that? I think you know, it, it's, there are some areas, as you know, we, we haven't talked about uh, uh, fair artificial intelligence or tra transparent artificial intelligence, but it kind of gets into that, that phase, which is the more clear lines there are that everybody operates to, the better. I'm, I never can, I'm never concerned about a company like Experian because it's what we do. You know, we're highly regulated. We have all these laws that we need to follow and comply with. We have experts that, you know, are always studying these things and, and trying to assess uh, if the lines are gray or not. We, we, we create clear black and white lines to operate within. So I don't worry about companies like Experian. It's all the companies that don't have those assets at their disposal. And particularly when you start going into the, we'll call it the gray area where people are experimenting uh, and, and challenging kind of the, the edge, which happens, where, where are consumers and businesses being protected? So I do think that's a, it's an area that, for public policy to, to, to weigh in and address. All right. I would like to thank Eric Haller, the Executive Vice President of Experian and the Global Head of Experian Data Labs, which is their R&D function. Eric, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Oh, you bet. Thank you. And everybody, thank you for watching. And in particular, those folks who contributed such great questions. Before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so you can get our newsletter. Thanks so much, everybody. And I hope you have a great day.